that has yet to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. While we find ourselves in a culture today uh, that is uh, overran with opportunities to be in the house of worship of our choosing, uh, Bibles uh, that are fingertips as well as many different other resources. Uh, but yet we see today not an increase. When you start looking at statistics, I will not bore you with lots of numbers today because I want to get into the Word. But we are today dealing with right now that we still have out of average, we look at we got about 17,000 uh, 20, 17,020 people groups, but out of that we have a little over 7,000 people groups that has yet to be reached uh, with the message of Jesus Christ, which makes up that 3.1 billion uh, people, just under the almost 3.2 billion. Uh, but when you begin to look at what is going and you see the, and I'm all for doing missions at home, so please don't misunderstand uh, my delivery today. I believe we have to be actively involved in our Jerusalem and our Judea, Samaria, and then go to the other most parts of the world. You can't go across the ocean uh, if you're not going to go across the street. So, but at the same time, if you go across the street, that does not mean that you're excluded from going across the ocean. We have to do all of it. Now, that does not mean every one of you are going to get on a plane uh, and go, uh, but it, I would say this, it would not hurt anybody in this room to do a short-term mission trip, whether it be domestic or whether it be foreign. Uh, it is something that's life-changing. I know some of you have the fear of flying, uh, but uh, God did not give you a spirit of fear. Right. Tell your neighbor, you can't, you can't use that excuse anymore. I'm not going to let you. Uh, but, uh, but, we, uh, but we're in a place today where we have to realize that if we look around the room, uh, we're the only ones in the room. So if we're not going to go, then who is? If we're not going to go across the street, if we're not going to go across town, then who's going to? If we're not going to go to our state, then who's going to? If we're not going to go to our nation, then who's going to? If we're not going to go to the nations of the world, then who will? I can tell you today that it isn't, uh, about those that has the has the the greatest skill or are are the greatest finances or are the greatest talents. Uh, it's just simply about those that are willing to be obedient. Uh, if uh, if he can use me, he can use any of you. Okay, just ask Debbie. She'll tell you all my flaws, all of my errors. She'll she'll just tell you. Uh, but this this morning, I, I want us to focus on the unfinished assignment today. In Jonah chapter number 3, we'll be there in just a moment, but you will find that in Jonah chapter number 1, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and he simply tells him, he says, I want you to, uh, to go to Nineveh and I want you to cry out against it. Basically, he was saying, I want you to take a message to a specific group of people and I want you to uh, share them with them the word that I give you. But Jonah simply said, I don't want to do that. Anybody in this room ever say, I don't want to do that? Now, husbands, don't look at your wives when you answer that question. Uh, but somebody comes along and says, uh, I, I'd like for you to do this or I'd like for you to do that. And you say, I, I don't want to do that. Well, that's the same thing that happened in Jonah chapter number 1. Because the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to cry out against it. And, and I'll, give, I'll give Jonah this. I'm not going to beat him up today. He had reasons for not wanting to do it. Good reason. Because they was mean people. They was vile people. They was disobedient people. They was the enemy of God's people. There's a whole list of stuff I can give you of why he didn't really want to go there in the natural. But the Lord said, I've chosen you to go be my mouthpiece, to go cry to a people so that judgment doesn't come to them. I'm going to give them an opportunity to choose either to repent or to ignore. But Jonah, he rose up and left the presence of the Lord and he 
went down to Tarnish and he paid a fare and he gets on a boat and says this, I'm going to go in the complete opposite direction because I am not going to fulfill the assignment that God gave me. But how many knows how that story went? All of a sudden there began to be a great wind and he finds himself falling asleep, which is a picture of apathy. We find that the moment that Jonah left the presence of the Lord, that he began to be rocked to sleep by the waves of the storm of the world that he was in, and when he began to walk in a place of disobedience instead of obedience, we began to see that there begins to be a wind that begins to blow, and the Lord says this, this is not going to go unnoticed. I'm just saying this today. You can do whatever you want to with it. The United States of America is created differently than any other nation that has ever been before it. We was created on Christian values. We was created for a specific purpose. And I believe that that, spe that specific purpose is twofold. It was to be a friend to Israel as well as to be the breadbasket of the world, not just in a natural means, but to take the glorious gospel message to the nations of the world. That is our purpose. But in recent years, while we have built buildings, erected structures, and built kingdoms for men instead of the kingdom of God, we have began to make this decision that Jonah did, I don't want to do that. And because of that, there began to be a falling asleep of men and women. And we have entered into a place of apathy. And because of the sleepiness of the church, because of the watchmen not sitting on the wall, and because of them not sounding the alarm when trouble was coming, we now are dealing with the waves of the storm that we're currently in in this nation. And now we are dealing with a generation that we are bearing prematurely because of addiction and oppression and depression and anxieties at an all-time rapid rate. We now are dealing with a society that is spiritually, emotionally, and physically unhealthy. All of it is a strategic attack of the enemy Knowing this, if I stricken them mentally, physically, spiritually, then they cannot fulfill the assignment that has been given to them. I am not one to boast or brag, but I will stand here today in this nation that I call home and I will stand here and tell you that we are no better than anybody else on this planet, but I will tell you that we have been birth with a great responsibility as Americans and it isn't to beat our chest and say how wonderful and altogether lovely we are but we have been birthed and placed for such a time as this to bring about the completion and the fulfillment of the God given assignment that was given to this nation to touch the nations of the world the return of the Lord is near. I understand that. Some of you from your childhood have heard that Jesus is coming. His return is nearer than it's ever been. But there is a commission that has got to be completed. And that can only be completed when you and I take up the responsibility and begin to fulfill the assignment. I want to say this this morning. The assignment is not going to change. That gift, that calling that you may be running from or resisting, it's not going to change. What God gave, allowed you to be birthed with and what he placed inside of you, you can run from it, you can resist it, but you're never going to experience the fulfillment and the joy and the happiness that you're desiring until you begin to walk in the fulfilling of the assignment that God has ordained you to be. Now, we find that Jonah finds himself in a storm 
he begins to cry out and he begins to repent. And we know that great fish spewed him out up on the beach. And we find that he shakes himself and he's trying to gather his thoughts. And all of a sudden in chapter number 3 where I want to take you this morning. Notice it says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And notice this, the assignment didn't change. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and he went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into that city, a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and he covered him with sackcloth and set in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout the city by the degree of the king and his nobles saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Allow me this morning to take the liberty to preach just for a few moments and teach for a few moments on the unfinished assignment. The need is very clear today. This world needs to hear but also needs to see Jesus Christ. How will it hear and how will it see unless we go? The problems of our society are not able to be fixed by the intellect or the wisdom of men. They do not have the ability to break the chains of addiction or depression or anxiety or oppression. What we're dealing today with is not natural, but it's spiritual. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. The church says today in America that we need revival. I agree with that statement. However, most do not know what revival is or what it cost. Allow me to tell you this morning that revival is not a series of meetings. Revival is not us coming together and shouting and running and patting each other on the back. There is a time and place for that. We are to be edified and we are to be equipped and we are to encourage the brethren. But a revival is when man comes to a place where he realizes, I have to do what the assignment is that God gave me where I become so consumed with it, where I can say this, I am not satisfied with just being. Jonah come to a place where he heard the word of the Lord and he said, I'm not going to do that. But we find that just in a short time, he then says, I will walk in obedience. And when he began to walk in obedience, notice with me, there was not a revival in Nineveh a place of repentance, a place of turning until first of all there was a reviving in Jonah. Notice in Jonah chapter number one it says this, he was in the presence of the Lord. A revival is a place or a, when an individual is living or basking or staying in the presence of the Lord, not visiting it. Jonah was in the presence of the Lord but his disobedience took him and it gave him into a place where he was in a storm. He actually says that he cried out from the belly of hell. But then he begins to call out to God. Notice it is easy to sit and analyze today the problems. 
But there comes a time where action is required to be taken. Notice Matthew 28, most of you can probably quote verse 19 and 20. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. But notice how verse number 19 starts. Go. That means it's action. Can I tell you today, you can say, I want my family saved. I want my city to be different. I, I, I want my state to be different. I want my nation. I want the nations of the world to hear Jesus Christ as Lord. But listen, it's going to take somebody getting active again. And that means this. Even, listen, young people, uh, you don't have to just sit in a local church uh, and just do what everybody else is doing. Listen, there's more to this thing than three songs and an offering and a message and then we come back next Sunday. But this is about being men and women of God that says, you know what, my purpose uh, to be on this planet is not to go to work and get a paycheck and pay an electric bill. But my purpose is to tell somebody uh, that Jesus came, he died, he rose again, uh, and he's coming again. Please hear me this morning. We have to be willing to go. The question today is a very personal one. And it requires each of us to self-examine. Are you, am I, fulfilling our God-given assignment? Well, how, how do I fulfill that God-given assignment? It means this. And, and I dealt with it last Sunday just briefly. I call it the three T's. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your talent? And what are you doing with your treasure? What, what are we really doing with the time? That How many knows time is precious? You think that you're going to be here tomorrow, but you don't have any promise for tomorrow. This could be the last day that you have on planet Earth. If you knew that today was the last day, would you get from your seat and would you go get in your car and would you go to the restaurant and then go home and sit down in the easy chair and kick back and maybe come to church tonight if, it, if you're not too tired? And then is that how you'd spend your day? No. You'd say, you know, if this is the last day that I have, i got to make sure that these last conversations that I have have great importance, have great weight. You'd be saying, you know what, I know that heaven's waiting for me. Listen, if I knew this is the last day I had, you all be in trouble. You wouldn't even get out of here today. I'd just keep you here all day. I'd just beat it into you today, whatever it took. And then I'd run and I'd have to try to reach my family. Listen, I'd have to scream with every fiber in me. But I don't know when my last day is, but I know this. I have to plan for the future, but i got to live today like it's my last day because it's the only day that I've been guaranteed and promised. Uh, and if I don't reach somebody today, I, I may not be able to reach them. I've got an assignment. Listen, nobody can scream and holler and spit like me because they're not me. Now, not everybody going to like how I scream, holler, and spit. That's fine. But there's somebody out there that will listen because God has ordained me just like he's ordained you to be a voice, to be an oracle, to speak that Jesus is Lord for this generation. But the question is, what are we doing with our time, our talent, and our treasure? While this may seem a little uncomfortable, allow me to show you the impact of one who becomes willing. In our text this morning in Jonah chapter number 3, there was a great reviving of a city because one man become willing to embrace the assignment. You have no idea how when you step into a place of obedience to your assignment of how far that reach is. As I mentioned earlier today, you think, okay, I'm going to take and I'm going to give a missions offerings today because of your obedience to the call to give a special gift of that. You have no idea of how far that will reach until you get into glory and get your reward. Listen, Jonah was one who refused 
But then he was one that repented. And he is one that God used tremendously for the saving of people. Notice with me, he was chosen by God to be a prophetic voice to the people of Nineveh. You may not see yourself today as someone of great influence. But please hear me. God has chosen to allow you and I to be alive for such a time as this. We see after a period of darkness of three days, Jonah been in the belly of that great fish. And after he spewed out, notice, he began to walk in a place of obedience. And as he began to preach with a prophetic voice, just simply share the message that God had gave him. Things began to change. Here's what he simply did. He cried mightily unto God. God heard him. God delivered him. He began to speak for God. And notice what happened. There was a king sitting in Nineveh that began to cry aloud. He began to enter into a place of prayer and fasting. And he began to speak these words, turn from your evil way. He began to take a city into a place of repentance. The city was spared because of the effects of one man's willingness to fulfill his assignment. I have to stand here and caution us today that in recent years, our refusal to be what God has called us to be in ministry it's taken us into a place where we are not productive, but where we are in a place of decline instead of increase. The church today across America and other parts of the globe is choosing to leave the presence of the Lord because they no longer see the importance of the Great Commission. Just as Nineveh gave heed to the prophetic warning given to them, it's you and I responsibility to self-examine and to take heed to the word of the Lord today and ask ourselves, are we really walking in the assignment that God has given to us? I will say this today. The assignment and the mandate that God has personally given to me I'm honest enough and transparent enough to tell you today that I cannot do what he's asked me to do in myself. I'm not strong enough. I'm not brave enough. I'll just be honest with you today. The only way I can do it is if I live continually in a lifestyle of prayer and fasting and the reading of his word where I'm continually giving myself to him so he can continually deposit into me. Listen, I'm just, a, I'm just a country boy from Connorsville, Indiana. Nothing extraordinary about me. But when I began to give myself to prayer, give myself to the word, give myself and say, God, and, and I, I, I didn't really know what I was saying. I was young, and, and I thought I knew. And... and and I would say this, don't pray this prayer unless you really mean that and willing to walk out the prayer. Because this, Lord, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere if you just help me. Hear me. After that prayer, my whole perspective, the things that I valued in life, everything began to change. The things that used to consume me when I was 20 years old, even things that consumed and took my time and attention even when I was 30 years old, no longer is there even a desire for most of those things. I like them. Uh, yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be fine. But there's nothing that draws my attention. I, and I now, I am continually... Thinking, striving to figure out how to be better at reaching the world for 
the message of Christ. I'll still talk to you about a 68 Camaro or an old 34 Ford. I, I listen, I, you, listen, we can talk about those things. I, I, we, we, but but they, they, they've, all, they've all faded. But if you want to get in my wheelhouse, so to speak, let's start talking about the unreached people groups of the world. Let's start talking about the fact that we begin to see God open doors supernaturally because somebody just says they're willing to go. Notice with me, is it really that important? We have to realize this. We will never change a nation. We'll never change a city. We'll never change the nations of the world. And please don't take this out of context. If we just continue to do what we're doing. Because preaching to the choir is not evangelizing the world. There was a conversation in scripture. People began to say, well, I'm with Apollos. And no, I'm with Paul. And I'm part of this and I'm part of that. That's what they were saying. But then Paul comes along and says, you know what? One plants, one waters. Sometimes, as much as I would desire to see that seed come up out of the ground and flourish and grow and produce fruit. I don't always get to see that. Sometimes you get to. But sometimes you're called to be the one that just plants the seed. Let me remind you. Just a few months ago, the farmer got on his tractor, disked his field, put the planter behind his machinery. And then he planted seed. Then he went back to the barn and he unhooked that stuff. And then he went about the rest of his business because he realized this, I did all I can do. Now it's up to God and it's up to somebody else. And he said, I may come back through in the fall and harvest it. But listen, I'm not going to stand and I'm not going to put a tent in that field and watch it every moment. Listen, you, you, we want to evangelize and we want to keep visiting those that we visit and we want to keep preaching. To them. But listen, if there is a rejection of the gospel message, you plant the seed, God has somebody coming behind you and you keep on going. You said, oh, but preacher, no, listen to me. The word of the Lord is very clear in Matthew chapter number 10. He said, if you go into a city, he said, if they receive you, you stay there, you give them the blessing. But if they don't receive you, then you just keep on going because there's other people that will receive you and receive my message if you keep going to them. I have another crew that's coming in behind you. There's a next generation. There's, there's another pastor. There's another preacher. There, there's another, there's another lay person there. Listen, don't you just camp out there because there's a world that needs to be reached. Listen, I have to plant seed, but I have to keep moving too. So when you just keep preaching to the choir, don't expect your city to be upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to keep moving. And the, the fulfilling of our assignment is this. Go unto all the world and to preach the gospel. Notice Mark chapter 16 said, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth in him and is baptized shall be saved. Notice with me, there is men and women that would receive the message right now, but nobody's taking it to them. Their heart has already been cultivated by the Holy Spirit. Somebody has already inserted a seed, uh, and now it's ripe, it's ready to be bursting forth, but they just need somebody <coughs> to tell them. Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to bring this to a close very quickly. Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. What shall we then say to these things? <coughs> what things? The commission that God has given us, the charge, the assignment. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not within him also freely give us all things? 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that he is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <coughs> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now what does that really mean? It means this. There is no excuse available for a man of God or a woman of God to not fulfill their God-given assignment which is to go into all the world because there is nothing that man can do or the kingdom of darkness that can do that can separate you from the love of Christ. He loves us with such a perfect love that no matter where I find myself, he is there. When the attacks are coming, he's still there. When opposition is present, he's still there. When I walk through the darkest of times, he's still there. When I find myself in the city where people are saying, I don't want to hear what you say, he's still there. When I go to the family reunion and everybody says, oh, he's radical, don't sit at his table, he's still there. But whether I find myself uh, on a foreign field and I don't even know what they're saying around me, he's still there. Uh, nothing is able to separate me from Christ. Uh, therefore, that means this. Uh, no matter where I go, uh, I have the power and the ability uh, to be the mouthpiece or the oracle that God has called me to be. Uh, he did not give me a spirit of fear, uh, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Uh, that means when the world is shaking around me, uh, I will not be moved uh, because I have been given an assignment, uh, I've been given a charge, uh, and I gotta tell somebody uh, that Jesus is Lord. Uh, I gotta tell somebody Somebody, uh, that he's still the healer. Uh, I gotta tell somebody that he's still the way maker. Uh, I gotta tell somebody uh, that he's still able to do exceedingly abundantly uh, what you could ever ask or think. Uh, I gotta tell somebody uh, he's still the rose of Sharon. Uh, he's still the lily in the valley. Uh, he's still the bright and morning star. Uh, he is still the prince of peace. Uh, he is still mighty God. Uh, he is still counselor. Uh, he is still the one uh, that is able to say, I'm the beginning and I am the end. Listen, I will not be silent. You can sit there and be proper if you want to, but there's a world that needs Jesus and he's chosen to have need of you and me, so let's do something about it. Is it really that important? Yes, it is. Listen, my friend, John the Revelator, he's been boiled in oil. They put him on the Isle of Patmos, but in the spirit on the Lord's day, he didn't get his revelation, but he got a revelation of Christ. And when he began to pin that, by the time you get to Revelation 21, notice he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away and there was no more sea and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. But, y'all missed a place to shout right there. But I want to show you something. When you get to verse number five, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, 
I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these are the words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Isn't that exciting and encouraging? But, verse number 8, hear me. But the fearful and the unbelieving. Tell your neighbor, say, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abdominal and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, you know, you, now hear me. But the fearful and the unbelieving. Why are we silent today? Because of a spirit of fear and because the church is full of men and women. I don't say this in a judgmental fashion. I'm just being real with you today. But we're sitting with unbelief. Well, I don't know if God really called me. I don't know if I'm really this or that. You're listening to the lies of the enemy. The enemy says you're not and you believe that versus where God says I've made you more than conquerors. Listen. We got to get rid of the unbelief and we got to get rid of the fear because fear and unbelief separates us from the things of God, the will of God, and when you do not walk in obedience of God, everything begins to be rent from you. Look at the story of Saul and we have to get back to a place where we realize uh, if we're going to make heaven our home, it is not enough for us to just say, well, I pray to prayer. There's a lot of people pray to prayer. But you go and you begin to read Hebrews 11. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. What's that mean? It means those that obtained a good report. How was a boat built? How did Abram leave an idolatrous nation and go to a place that he didn't even know he was going? How was it that Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, and the list goes on and on of people we could talk about today. How was it they was able to stand in the face of adversity and be men and women of God? It's because of this. They had active faith. In such a manner, they said, we're going to fulfill our assignment. Careful, king, we're not careful to answer thee. Our God is able to deliver us from that fiery furnace. But if he does it, we still not going to bow. Listen, there's some fire that you're going to have to walk through. There's some threats that the enemy's going to make. There's some opposition that you're going to not really understand. But there is nothing that's able to separate you. Romans 8, don't ever forget it. There is nothing that's able to separate you from the love of God. And that means this, if I'm walking in his love, then I've cast off fear and unbelief and therefore I'm able to walk any place, anywhere, at any time and be the mouthpiece that God has called me to be. I'm trying this morning to get you to understand by the unction of the Holy Spirit that there is a God-given assignment upon your life and upon my life to reach our city, to reach our family, as well as the nations of the world. And we got to go beyond the four walls of our buildings uh, and we're going to have to once again begin to burn with passion and know this, uh, that God has equipped us and he has ordained us uh, to be those that go in 2019. But the question is, will you allow fear and unbelief to keep you from the fulfilling of your assignment? As they come to the music this morning, there is an unfinished work. 
I know there's difference of opinions. There's difference in theology. But through my study, through my interpretation of Scripture, when you begin to look and it says go into all the world, preach the gospel. It says in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. You take the original language and you take nations back, it really ends up being people groups. With all of the resources that we have, the technology that we have today, to the best of our ability, out of the 17,000 people groups on this planet, we have just a little over 7,000 of those people groups that have not yet been reached. Currently, right now, I am in conversation with Dr. Howard Foltz from Ames International. And they have made an initiative in the next five years that they're going to reach 3,500 of those unreached people groups, which means there's 3,500 left after that. We are currently looking, and they have to give me some more information, and we'll have a conversation when I get back in November, adopting one of those unreached people groups as a body of Christ. For $3,500, we can provide housing, monies that will provide medical care as well as resources for a man to go in and live amongst the people for a year. We're looking to do that hopefully the first of the year. From this house in Connorsville, Indiana, to you and I corporately together by giving $3,500. What's $3,500? Really? Say, that's a lot of money. It is, but it isn't. You ought to see what I just paid for a wedding that lasted 20 minutes. We don't want to talk about money. $3,500, get this. While we're in Connorsville, Indiana, we can begin to pray for a man and his family to go into the darkest corners of this globe and every soul that he reaches, every footprint that he makes, is probably going to be in Turkey. That's where my heart is. And every time he wins a soul, it's going to come right back to you. Think about this. All because he was willing to say, I'll go. Because I'll take the initiative. I'll be the one to go. How am I going? You say, but I'm not going. I'm still here. Listen, you're going because your time, your talent, your treasure. There's no space with God. See, when you come in on Monday night and pray, Tuesday night and pray, throughout the week and pray, even in your daily devotions when you get down and you kneel and you begin to call out and giving of your time and your energy God help that man help his family help that mission you get connected help that tribal group of people you're giving, you're going you're going, you're going and God begins to ordain you in greater fashion listen there's a world that needs to be reached. And while we're focused on going, let me remind you that the person next door to you in your neighborhood, they've not heard Jesus either. I want to show you how real it is and how quickly you can lose this thing. My father and my mother gave all of their adult life to ministry pastor, labored, bivocational all of his life, gave of himself continually. They had 13 children, all of their children raised in the house of the Lord, but 
and their children now has had children. And some of those children don't know Jesus. They can't give you one Bible verse. Some of those children, you can probably count on your hands how many times they've been in the house of worship. But now those children are having children and those children have never heard Jesus. They've never been in a church. That's how quickly we lose it. I can't afford to lose it. I want you to hear my heart this morning. Can I be transparent and honest with you today? Everybody said, how are you going to make it through yesterday? Yesterday was, yesterday was, it was ordained by God, so it didn't really bother me too much. Today's a hard day. Today's a hard day. Probably about 15, 16 years, my baby's been on this platform nearly every Sunday morning. She sung with me. She's been on the mission field with me. I'm thankful for where they're going to be, yeah. Man, that's tough. Not seeing my baby. But I'd rather my baby be in Ohio or back in Guatemala or back in, uh, go to Turkey or Army, wherever. I would rather her be there in the will of God, the presence of God, than her to be next door to me and not know Him and not serving Him. It's, listen, I know y'all don't like it when I talk this way, but I'm praying God just gives your children a mission's heart and not that they go away from you, they'll always come back, trust me. Everybody tells me they come back, they always come back with more. Some of you can testify to that. As, as long as they go, touch the world. As they come back, listen. When they come back, we put our arms around them, we love them, and then we just didn't, we just give them Jesus and then let that next generation be raised up and go out again. But you and I gotta, we gotta use our voice this morning. Whether it be across the street or across the water, let's fulfill our assignment. What's my assignment, preacher? telling everybody about Jesus as we stand all over the house this morning. There's many reasons for us not to do what God puts in our heart to do. I'll be honest with you. Since 2004 to present day I've been on the mission field nearly 40 times there's a lot of reasons I could say that I couldn't go do those things that God had put in my heart to do I could use the excuse I'm not qualified or I don't have financial stability or I don't have the means I, I don't have the intellect I, I, listen, I, I, could, I could give you a whole list that I always went down when the next door opened or the next challenge came but at the end of the day, there was really no, no good reason not to. Because I say, Lord, I'm not able. And then God will just say, well, here, I'll make you able. And he just makes a way, makes a way, makes a way. Has it always been easy? No. Has there been some uncomfortable situations? Yes. Has there been a lot of challenges? Oh, yeah. But every time in the midst of that challenge, I've seen God stand and supernaturally protect and provide. Listen, I don't stand here before you with a big, nice retirement plan because retirement's not in my future. And I'm not investing in anything. I used to get caught up in investing in some things. And I, 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 it, listen, I'm investing in the kingdom. I came in with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing. I'm not laying anything up here. All of my time 
is his, my talent is his, what little I have, and my treasure. Because it's worth just one more song. Now I can let a spirit of fear keep me. I could let doubting creep in. But you come too late to tell me now that he's not real. He showed himself too many times. He's protected me too many times. And maybe you're here this morning and there's a there's that urgency in your spirit. There's that call. You know that the Bevan, you're like, man, that's just beyond me. <coughs> that's just bigger than me. And fear always tries to come in and try to give you a list of why you can't. There is nothing that's impossible with him. And if you've been in that state of struggle, I, I'm going to, I'm believing today is the day for that to just be broken off of you. They're going to minister in song.